so guys we have with us uh, dr anish mohammed who is a senior editor of the jbba and uh, uh, the cryptography zero knowledge proof guy and we have invited uh, dr anish today to talk about uh, zero knowledge proofs what are these um this is a topic that uh, um, most people do not have a very good understanding and i certainly talk to a lot of policy makers regulators they want to understand what it means and what it means when we say you know prove prove your identity without revealing much information about your identity so this is a topic that is quite um, is interesting is important especially when it comes to building self sovereign identity projects digital identity very important topic and uh, anish has done a lot of work in this area so we thought we invite anish today uh, in our forum to talk about what it means what is it exactly what are the applications of it and how people can benefit from it how countries can benefit from from from, from this and building applications decentralized identities and all that so uh, thank you very much uh, anish over to you thank you uh thank you i don't know how to do slides in here so that's the challenge uh let me see if i can share any adverse slide challenge slides no okay it doesn't work okay so i i think i will you know talk and then you know possibly have a few i have 10 minutes right so i i yeah. have i prepared a bunch of deck of slides and i send it across to you via email i don't know if you have the ability to put it up somewhere but in okay, summary you... i can talk yeah. about oh, yeah yeah so uh, in summary i can actually explain this in very simple terms so uh, i'll first give a bit of history as to how it evolved then i probably will walk you through you know the various kinds of fl of flavors of zero knowledge and kind of uh, very quickly talk about like uh, you know what the use cases could be and uh, i think by then the uh, you know the, the 10 minutes would be over so let's imagine we are all in the room right and uh, i'm going to build this construct the zero knowledge proof uh, using this uh, construct uh, and uh, I, I just walk in and i wanted to prove to somebody that i have the ability to escape from a room with one door so what happens here is like uh, in the world of zero knowledge uh, the person who wants to prove a claim uh, is called a prover and the person who actually verifies the claim is called a verifier so if i were to prove to all of you i you know one of your volunteers would say okay you know what uh, i'll be the verifier and then uh, both me and the verifier would walk up to the room with one door and then the verifier would ask me to walk into the room and then close the door uh, behind behind me in that sense and then say in a few minutes time uh, i have the ability uh, to escape from the room then if it's true then you would actually see me uh, uh, you know get outside the room without using the door so why is this zero knowledge this is zero knowledge because i you know the person who's a verifier doesn't have the exact ability to understand how i escaped but you know that i escaped so effectively what is happening is you can actually run this experiment as many times as you really want so the the, the number of times could be you know dependent on how you actually define zero knowledge in that sense but in summary even if you were to do 10 times the amount of information you have on how i am able to escape remains the same which is going to be zero so this is the basis of zero knowledge and typically when you want to actually describe this we use this example of where is waldo so waldo is like a, a children's comic example like this, this is what people your slide. To understand oh Anish, good you got okay your slide. I, yeah mm. uh good uh, can, can we go to slide number three then this one uh i can't see oh god uh slide number three is it, it says where is waldo and there's uh, lots of pictures in there pictures so, okay I, I can walk through i can walk through the whole thing so yeah, yeah. i am only i am unable to see the slides but i'm assuming you can see the slide so uh you know yeah the it's, classic uh, it's case, there it's there it's in okay. the, yeah. oh, right. 
Okay, so the, the thing, uh, oh, uh, hold on. Uh, yeah, I found it, I found it, yes. So you're absolutely right. Okay, so it, this is another classic example, right? This example is that of, uh, you know, where is Waldo? It, it, this is a, you know, a, a children's book kind of scenario. Oh God, I lost the, I am, I am out of the room. I can't see now. Oh, this is so, oh, I'm in the water now. This is so bad. Uh, this is so terrible. Okay, <laughs> now I am lost. Oh, okay, hold on. Let me see if I can see anything. Oh God, this is so terrible. You know what? I'm going to talk, and I'm assuming you can see the slides. Yeah, we so, can move uh, the slides. You know, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So you know, you can see the slide there. The, the slide is like uh, the question here is like, can you prove that you know there exists Waldo? Right. That's the question, and this is like you know, one big picture and you need to actually prove that you know. But the thing is, if you have like a very small piece of paper and uh, you put a hole in it, then you'll be able to exactly know where this is, right? So the next slide, which is essentially showing how this mechanism works, right? You take a, a very large piece of paper, you cut a small hole inside it, right? And the thing here is like the size of the paper is much much uh, as in the paper that covers is much 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 bigger than you know at least like four times bigger than the size of the original painting right so then you it would, it would allow you to actually move this thing around the picture around so by just knowing that uh, where the hole is you won't be able to figure out exactly where the uh, where the picture is on the picture you know where waldo is on the picture right if you go to the next slide it will actually show you the 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 orientation of this uh, picture with regard to the bigger piece of paper, right? So why am I describing this? The reason I'm describing this is like, this gives you this unique ability to prove things. And even better, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, there are three properties that are there, right? And I really, really love uh, com completeness and soundness. So this, the constructor zero knowledge was put together by three people Shafi Goldwasser, Sylvia Mihali, and Rakoff. So, of the three, I've never met Rakoff, but I've met uh, Shafi Goldwasser and Sylvia Mihali. Apparently, the stories I've heard from them, they were in Berkeley when this happened, and they tried to submit this paper to conferences. They got rejected multiple times, and suddenly, you know, everybody realized the value. So uh, first of the properties that I really wanted to talk about is called completeness, right? So this is a unique thing, right? If the prover is telling the tr truth, then they will eventually convince the verifier, okay? So let me give you an example on why this is very unique. So imagine, uh, you know, any of you has somebody else who you trust uh, very much, and you have a, you know, kind of an argument between the two of you, and you want to actually prove something to the other party, right? And you want you don't want to reveal what is it that has happened, but you want to make a claim. So, say for example, two of you actually have a bank account, right? And some money, some amount of money is actually missing, and then it's just obvious. But like even in that instance, it should be very clear for you to actually run up knowledge proof. And the conditionality here is going by completeness. As long as you tell the truth, you will uh, you will convince the verifier. So you are the prover, the other party is the verifier. You run the protocol at this end of this game, they will be convinced. And the second part is the more brilliant part, soundness, okay? The prover can only convince the verifier if they are actually telling the truth. So this is the most important bet, right? Combine the two together, and then you will fully understand the power of zero knowledge. So if you have a two-party uh, or multi-party situation where you want to prove something as a claim, you are not revealing the details of the claim, right? So this could be, a, you know, you're being accused of traveling to some part of the world, and you say no, you haven't, right? And the the beauty is here is like a, as long as you tell the truth, the other party will be convinced within a bounded period of time. I will go into the constructor bounded period of time. And the second part of it is even better. You can only prove it to them if and only if you are telling the truth. I hope you really, uh, you know, take a moment to understand the power of this construct. You know, you have never told the truth about what is it that you have. Only you have done is you made a claim and you created proofs. And once you have the proofs and you run a zero knowledge protocol, you are able to prove to uh, 
uh, a third party, A, that, you know, whatever you claim is true, and you can convince them that what you, you know, you, you can convince them as well, as long as you're telling the truth. So both parties could be pretty assured that, you know, both of them are safe in that sense. This to me is like a most powerful thing. But there is also zero knowledge, which I kind of described already. The, the zero knowledge test should be thought of as like the room experiment, right? So it's like, you know, we can have uh, this rerun the experiment of me being close inside the room and me escaping as many times as I want. But, you know, the knowledge of how I escape will never be revealed to anybody else. So can I go to the next slide, please? So typically we have like three classes of uh, zero knowledge proofs, right? what we call a perfect zero knowledge, then statistical zero knowledge, and computational zero knowledge, right? You know, if you were to think about the perfect zero knowledge, um, it, 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 it assumes that, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a perfect condition in the sense. It's like, uh, in sense of speaking, it's impossible to recognize between a real conversation and a simulated conversation. This is the language construct. So. The world of zero knowledge normally lives in a domain called complexity theory. Like you, you, you describe languages there, so you define languages. And whenever you want to have something as, uh, you know, when you want to measure complexity, you try to think about this in terms of uh, conversations and trying to understand, are you able to recognize between a real conversation and a similar conversation? Then there is this construct, which is slightly lower called statistical zero knowledge, which essentially means it's like, if you were to look at the real and simulated, are you able to see the difference in, in terms of statistics? So you apply some statistical tools to see the uh, variance, and then you try to figure that out. And the third one is a computational one. The computational one is like you have a, uh, you know, a computational indistinguishability, which is, that means it's like between the first and the two, given you have a, com a compute platform at, at your disposal, you are unable to distinguish between the two. And typically speaking, last one is the one that we would normally use in a practical sense. Okay, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So, if, if you are really bored and you really want to get a good idea of, uh, you know, uh, zero, zero knowledge evolution, there was one article that was written by Eli Sass, and uh, it was called the Cambrian Explosion of Crypto Proofs. So, it's like a good read if you have like half an hour of your time and you just want to read it, you could definitely do that, right? I will try to give you a quick summary of like uh, various cryptographic primitives that evolved that resulted in what we have right now, okay? And uh, forgive me for not going into a lot of detail because like I have very little time and I, I don't think this is probably the best format. Oh God, this PDF is horrible. It didn't really work out possibly, okay? So I'll give you the history of cryptography, and this is the next slide, which is kind of describing the evolution. So, you know, as probably you know, all of you might remember, in the 1970s is when the first of the, uh, you know, asymmetric crypto startup evolving, right? And so when that started evolving, we actually have like a bunch of tooling that were available to us. So essentially, both integer factorization and discrete log problem was available to us. So we, we had this trapdoor function. So the party who knows the trapdoor is able to solve it faster. The party who doesn't know the trapdoor, the finding a complexity is much higher than the complexity that, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 the persons don't have will, will have, uh, come across, right? And then what has happened is like then uh, some, uh, you know, more progress happened. Elliptic, elliptic curves happened in between, and uh, you know, tooling of the elliptic curve uh, resulted in an elliptic curve discrete law problem, which is essentially given a point. Uh, if a point jumps around a multiple number of times, if you just see the point on the curve, can we actually figure out how many times this point has jumped around? So, you know, intuitively speaking, uh, adding two points on an elliptic curve is kind of a geometric thing. And I don't have a slide, I deleted this slide, but just imagine it to be like, you know, if you have an elliptic curve and you want to add points, that's a geometric process. And it looks like a reflection on x-axis at some points and other times in various ways. But it just goes around randomly. And the, 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 the difficulty is given a, given a point, uh, and you want to generate a point, uh, the, 
the modulus of the whole thing and then you know you, you find the point which you actually just found after n n times of multi, uh, jumping or multiplication right can you actually figure it out that's the elliptical discrete problem so then what has happened is there's like a bunch of other you know improvements in uh, zero knowledge space that has actually happened and I, I will probably go into the next slide and give you like a quick uh, intro of uh, the zero knowledge world so i am probably just going to talk a bit about uh, snarks and docs and possibly i i, I will probably stop uh, after a short comparison of that and giving a couple of use cases i mean uh, the slides were actually made for people from my team and for a couple of other people which is should have not assumed uh how could i say familiarity with all the acronyms so uh, let me start by just describing from a blockchain perspective right one of the things that really really uh, was path breaking in terms of zero knowledge was like when we had zero knowledge it was mostly interactive zero knowledge, right? So it is interactive uh, uh, protocol. So essentially what this means is if you were to go back and think about our room protocol, that's an interactive protocol. So me and the verifier have to do multiple rounds. Imagine in some sense if there was a way I could guess something, right? Well, that would be like one byte to raise to n kind of to raise to minus n possibility that I could actually guess it, right? So this is how you actually put a bound on, you know, how much of uh, security would you actually get? So uh, in 2013, there was this uh, paper that actually came out. First of the non-interactive zero knowledge schemes came out, right? And the, the, the thing was, it was the possibility that you can actually have like a, a interactive protocol and then you you could use a fiat shami transform to actually convert that into a non-interactive one. And that also helps that you actually have a Merkle tree that's out there, right? So Merkle trees, as you can see, uh, is part and parcel of all blockchain. So this implied that the first, first time there was this protocol that could actually use zero knowledge proofs to actually prove transfer of value, right? Or rather ownership of value. So let me just go to the next one. I mean, I, uh, we'll go to the next slide because like, I don't want to go kill everybody with all the details. So the first of the schemes to come out was called Zcash. This was in 2016. So, you know, the basis of that was a snack sucks in non-interactive argument of knowledge, right? So what's, let's go to the next slide. I will probably walk through slightly faster. So the snack starts for ZK, which is like a zero knowledge. Like, you know, you could actually prove to somebody that you have the ability to spend a particular token. That's what it means. Succinct because uh, it's short proof. Uh, you have a, a proof that's very, very long. It doesn't really help you. So uh, N is non-interactive uh, and AR is argument and uh, K is knowledge. So the way I would describe it is like a, a, in the cache, the first iteration of it, it was actually using growth 16. Um, so uh, Jens Groth, who happened to be for a period in time in UCL, of all the people that might know UCL. He was there and he published the paper while he was there. And uh, it was in 2016. And that, that, then uh, the scheme improved and there were a whole bunch of other ones that happened. So uh, SNARK actually have this, uh, how could I say, uh, exposure to a quantum computer. What I mean by that is like, in a world where we have quantum computers, we have the ability to do both discrete block problem which is what I was describing, elliptical discrete log problem, which is what I was describing. And also RSA is, is integer factorization. Given a very, very rough, arbitrary, large, uh, random, uh, you know, uh, composite number, you could factor it to do uh, you know, fa fa primes in that sense. So this, this is known to be NP complete. And in a, quantum, uh, in a quantum world, we could actually have Grover's algorithm and Grover's algorithm could actually solve this really really fast okay so then what has happened uh, can we go to the next slide please so what happened is like one of the people who was actually involved in writing the original uh, you know paper you know, paper is Eli Assassin. so and i kind of pointed you at a blog that he has written as well so he came up with another uh, you know non-interactive uh, zero knowledge proof which doesn't require security of elliptic curves uh, to actually have the security for the scheme 
Snarks require the, you know, elliptic curve distribution lock problem as a security of the scheme. Whereas Stark doesn't. Uh, Stark only requires uh, you know, security of a shooter random function. So the whole, and it, it's an interesting paper, scalable, transparent, post-quantum secure computation with integrity. That's how they titled it. And the thing here is like, in a Q, Q, QC world, uh, Starks are resistant because it's like it doesn't require an empty curve discrete law problem. It only requires just a hash function, right? And the whole idea is like, uh, if you have a polynomial, you don't have to test the polynomial in all the points. If you just test it, test it in a small set of points, you should be able to see whether the person who is talking to you is lying or not. I mean, in lying in the sense like I'm talking about creating proofs and otherwise. So can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, that's literally like uh, you know a quick comparison of uh, you know uh, top three I would say zero knowledge schemes. The first of them I would consider is snarks. Okay, uh, I also should say this to you. So it's like whenever you have a snark, you have a process called the setup, and uh, there is this construct of universal setup, and uh, uh, there's also this lack of universal setup. Uh, the one that I was talking about, which is growth, which is one of the most common ones. It doesn't have the universal setup thing. What I mean by this is like, for every time you actually want to prove a, a, a proof, a greater rank one constraint system to actually represent your circuits and you want to prove, you will have to do a setup. So this setup involves all the parties, uh, you know, uh, working together to create a pro proving key and a verification key, right? Uh, and the, one of the benefits of Starks is Starks doesn't require setup, right? Uh, Snarks require a setup. And bulletproof is like, a uh, third of the category of zero knowledge proofs, which actually is a uh, security comes from integer factorization. And if you were to look at the proof sizes, proof over time, and identification time, you could possibly see that snarks, in one sense of speaking, again, uh, you know, there could be uh, accusation of biases against me. I am somebody who actually has uh, my team has produced a snark. Uh, so, you know, I'm very biased towards snarks and my protocol actually uses snarks. So in that sense, I've been spending a very long time working on snarks, so I might be biased. So I put my hand up and say, that is a possibility I might be biased. But uh, you know, this is from a paper, I took it from a paper, I can give you the source of the paper as well. This is the uh, proof, proof size comparison, uh, the prover time comparison and verification time comparison. If you think about it, uh, you know, snarks seem to be doing pretty good. Stocks do have some benefits, which is essentially no setups. Uh, you don't actually have to worry about some nation state actually having a quantum computer. And bulletproof is probably the worst in that sense, right? And let's talk about you know uses of uh, you know uh, zero knowledge. That's, that's the next slide. So you know, typically you could classify this into uh, you know three kinds of things, like proving a statement on private data, right? So you make a claim, okay, just imagine that uh, I say uh, to somebody that I have enough of money to buy a car, right? And whatever the car is. So it is very possible that I can actually pro provide zero knowledge proof to that, right? Then there's uh, anonymous authorization. So in, in this instance, most of this authentication and authorization mechanisms have a problem. There's a replay attack, right? If if in an imaginary world, I were to just use a password, the, there's always this thing called a man in the middle attack. So the person in the middle could actually take my password and then forward it on and it could become me, right? And there's always this well-known case of post chess, which is like you could arbitrarily play against any grandmaster as long as you, both, you have the ability to communicate using both, you know, an asynchronous method, which is like a post or email or whatever it is, right? So what you do is like you start the game, you start with two grandmasters and uh, you know you copy one to the other, right? And both the grandmasters would be thinking that you are the grandmaster that they're playing against. So you would act as if you were a grandmaster even though you know nothing about chess. I'm not suggesting you do this, but this is a thought experiment, right? So then there's the third one, which is, which is outsourcing computation, which is essentially an interesting thing. You, you want to check something and you don't want to really, uh, you know, uh, reveal any of it, but just want assurance that it, it is done the right way. Okay, so can I go to the next slide, please? So this is uh, anonymous authorization, proving that uh, you access without revealing your identity or login. I already mentioned this. Also, you could do group membership, right? So you can actually prove in zero knowledge that you are a member of the group, say JBBA, right? So 
you want to prove to somebody you are a member of JPTA without revealing anything about yourself. That's terrible, right? And then approving, can I go to the next slide, please? Uh, so approving statements on uh, private data, right? So I, I think I already talked about the first one, which is like proving that I have a money enough to buy about X, which is more than more than enough to buy a car. And there's also, uh, you know, you could also prove that uh, a case of say DNA fingerprinting, right? So you can either prove in zero knowledge that your DNA is in, in the set or outside of the set, right? Uh, and you could also do proof of innocence in one sense. So it's like, imagine that you're being accused of actually doing a transaction, right? And you could actually provide the proof that you didn't do the transaction. Then uh, last of the slides, uh, sorry, next slide, please. So this is about, uh, you know, you know, classic case of payment system, right? So you could easily uh, do KYC. KYC is know your customer, which is essentially, you have some party who would look into your documentation which is essentially most likely a passport or identity issued by some government. Then they would also look at uh, what I would describe as, as some, something like your know, proof of uh, address. And once they say yes, then they will allow you to do the transaction. And uh, also proving secure anonymous transfers. Like we already had a quick chat about Zcash. Zcash is an example. Of, uh, anonymous transfer so you know you can definitely do that so yeah uh, i just wanted to just have a quick quick chat about you know how to accelerate things so typical applications how to accelerate things so everybody gets an idea of how things would be accelerated because by now you would have recognized that why if zero knowledge is magical why isn't that we are using everything in zero knowledge the truth to that is like the computation overhead for doing that is quite high and typically what you have is like three classes of hardware one is gpus like gpus on media uh, and uh, field programmable gate arrays the field programmable gate arrays are programmable logic where you can actually program something and then you could actually run it right and then there is silica right like true silica where you actually have like uh, application specific integrated circuits right application specific integration circuits are the the one that actually takes the most amount of effort and the most amount of money in FPGAs, you can actually buy for Zillinix and other people, and you can just program it. Uh, you can't see the camera, otherwise I could have shown you a bunch of FPGAs and a bunch of GPUs. So I have some spare time interest in accelerating ZK. So applications from a very blockchain -y perspective, these are rollups. So if you were to think about L2s, uh, imagine Ethereum, uh, the ZK L2s, they could definitely use uh, you know, the, the hardware to accelerate bridges. So, you know, imagine you, you're talking between two uh, L2s in that sense. So, you know, or L2s to an L1. So, imagine you have uh, ZK Sync and you are sat on the uh, Ethereum. So, your bridging is like, okay, between the two, that, that could be ZK. Uh, DIDs, uh, distributed IDs, which is essentially something uh, b before I was starting to give the talk, uh, the previous speaker was kind of describing it. So, privacy apps and of change scenarios okay so that's kind of what it is i don't want to kill you all with all the details of it and last of the slide is like uh you know i had put together some resources i would strongly recommend recommend reading uh with vitalik's blog right there's also a series of uh blog posts by i can't remember the person's name but uh you know six blog posts and a paper which is very very helpful and uh, if you are somebody who actually wants to read a book, uh, Foundations of Cryptography Basic Tools is pretty interesting. It's the first volume. And uh, yeah, I think I am done uh, talking. I probably spoke much more longer than I thought. Thank you very much, Anish. <clears throat> that was an excellent presentation. We had, uh, we had two questions uh, quickly, if you could. Oh, uh, please. Yeah. Maybe answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Happy first to. one was uh, yeah. using blockchain where where would zero knowledge proofs be integrated in a blockchain would this be in the form of a smart contract okay so it's multiple ways you can actually do this so yes the uh, the, 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 the that the immediate answer to the question is yes you can have it in zero knowledge and uh, in smart contract you can actually have it in l2 and you can have it in l1 what i mean by this is like if you're a blockchain you could actually have a zero knowledge uh, fu fundamentally built into the blockchain 
and that will be an L1. Okay, so if you think about ZK sync, that's uh, or scroll, uh, you actually and Polygon also has a variant where you could actually have a zero knowledge integrated into an L2. Uh, I'm assuming everybody knows an L2. Okay, and you absolutely are correct in asking if could be done as a uh, smart contract. Yes. So if you are an Ethereum, uh, you could actually use Circom and you could get Gold 16 and the ones and like you can use it. Thank you. And the the last question was uh, any government public departments in the world using ZKPs for citizens? I mean, you spent some time in uh -huh. Middle East as well. Are there any departments that you've been actually using as a use case? Uh, I have no ability to actually verify government usage, but I can give you lots and lots of, uh, you know, uh, Web3 usage, right? So uh, I, I don't have the access to the governments globally to say, you know, if anybody is using it. If people were to use it, people like Estonia would be like the best candidates because they are very early adopters and, uh, you know, they're very technically savvy. In fact, in 2017, when I was invited to the, their parliament, they were looking at technologies like this. So, you know, if there are governments using it. But having said this, I should say this to you. UK is also ahead of the curve. So in 2020, we actually had an incubator for NPCs, right? So there's a class of zero knowledge which actually has NPC at its head. So I wouldn't be surprised if there are various pieces that exist in the UK as well. I don't know. So I will put my hand up and say, I don't know, but these are the possible candidates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Well, um, okay. Thank you. So that was an excellent presentation from, from Dr. Anish Mohammed. Um, with that, we conclude our session. This uh, session is recorded and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel uh, shortly.